May the warmth and the presence of the love of God fill your heart this day and always. I'd like to read from the Gospel of Matthew. Some folks don't understand why I bother to read a 2,000 year old document, but I consider it to be part of a well, maybe a four or five thousand year old conversation that's pointing the way towards our ability to uh, express this creative power, urgency, and love of God into the world. It was written at a particular time in that conversation, and so of course it, it uses symbols and language and images that fit the worldview of the time. But I think we do well to look back to it and see if it might set a direction for us. So I invite you to listen to this word from the Spirit of God. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. You remember last week, Jesus, the risen Jesus, told the women to tell the disciples to meet him in Galilee. And when they saw Jesus, they worshipped him, but some of them doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. We have arrived at the end of the world. Now, finally, we can construct a new one. It's our chance right now to reform ourselves as spiritual, scientific, and ethical beings. My friend Zach Stein wrote that in a wonderful article in Insight. You can look it up on the web or write to me and I'll send you a link if you'd like. But I'm wondering if you've caught any glimpses of that new creation, that new world we're looking to build over these last weeks. I know I have. You can see it in little ways. There's a wonderful woman in our town who uh, owns a pet shop and walks dogs for a living. And a lot of folks aren't having her do that now. And so there are three or four folks in that community of people who've decided to just go ahead and pay her for the rest of the year. Oh, she'll pay it back somewhere along the line, but it's a recognition that that's the situation for her. People are making an effort to uh, do takeout at restaurants because we recognize that those businesses need our support. But more than that, is the enormous and incredible cooperation I've seen as everybody locks down, socially isolates. It's not all out of fear, it's out of a sense of, I don't know, responsibility. I've spoken to some young people this week who aren't really worried about the virus for themselves at all, but their cooperation comes from their desire not to infect other people they recognize that they're part of a larger community and they need to fit in. That's a, that's a glimpse of that newly constructed kind of world. I, I even see it in Congress. I mean, you know, the relief package that was passed, while apparently insufficient for the time and more will be needed, was enormous and it was a tacit admission of everybody, Democrats and Republicans, that government has a place, that all the people need to pull together and find ways to stabilize our economy, or none of us will do well. Yeah, I see glimpses of it, but it's been predictable that the backlash has really begun. You know, we're seeing the protests and the anger, seeing people defy requests or orders to socially isolate. People who aren't caring so much about other people because they're afraid. I understand that. 
They're afraid of a lot of things. They're afraid to lose their livelihoods. They're afraid of what happens next. I mean, for goodness sakes, we're in this for the long haul. This lockdown is the shock, sure, but we're gonna be doing a dance with this virus for a year or two. Who knows, maybe even longer. We're gonna to have to pull back and go out. Different parts of the economy will be able to start and other parts won't. People are gonna be caught up in that mess. So it makes sense to be afraid. I understand that. And then how does government act? What kind of orders does it uh, pursue? There's good reason to protest some of these lockdown orders. There's fear that our civil liberties will be encroached upon and I get that. We'll be much better off if people adhere to those orders because they believe it's the cooperative and right thing to do and not out of fear of the government coercing them into doing something. But in order to achieve that kind of cooperation in the face of this kind of fear over this much time, we're gonna to need to reform our spiritual, scientific, and ethical character. We're gonna to need to develop what I'm calling a greater spiritual infrastructure in each one of our lives and within all of our communities. It's the only way that we're going to be able to move towards that new world that we've been glimpsing. It's always sort of been there. I mean, that piece that I played right before the beginning of this service shows cooperation all over the world. People have been reaching for this. But it's not gonna come naturally to us unless we start to think differently about ourselves and why we're here. What's going on? That's what happens in the midst of chaos. We get to start to reform the way we look at things. That's what was going on in this, uh, in this Gospel of Matthew. You know, people focus on the idea that it's a story about Jesus, and Jesus said this, and Jesus said that. And then, okay, that's fine. But Matthew wrote it, you know, probably 50, 60 years after Jesus died. He wrote it to a community that was in the midst of enormous chaos. The very center of their spiritual lives, center of much of their economic life had been annihilated by the Roman government. The temple was destroyed. Understand, they thought God lived in that building up there. What did it mean that it was destroyed and that they couldn't do the things they, they used to do to give life its structure, its meaning, its brought its communal focus in together. Now, Matthew wrote this story about Jesus at that time because he sought to tell those people what it was that they needed to do to build a new world, to take advantage of this moment, of this chance to reform their spiritual, perhaps not their scientific, but their ethical character so that we could all express the love of God more clearly. That's the project of these scriptures, of this 4,000-year-old conversation. So he told this story, and we're on this mountain at the end of it. The thing is, Matthew took us to the mountain three other times in the story, and those three times give us a real clue as to the kinds of things that are necessary to rebuild a spiritual infrastructure within our own hearts and communities. First time he's on the mountain is during the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus is talking about forming the ethical character of a community. What does it look like? It comes down to love, but love is one of those tricky words that it can mean just about anything to anybody. I mean, you know, it's kind of a Rorschach test. But when I say it, I'm talking about a dance, a dance between seeing what's in the world and wanting to put value into it, wanting to rebuild it, almost an artistic endeavor, and enjoying what's there. This give and take, this dance that gives life its, I don't know, its juice. That's the first time Jesus went to the mountain was to do that. Second time he went to the mountain was to pray. I've been 
teasing my father for years when he tells me he's never meditated. My dad, the preacher, you know, and that's of his generation and that's okay. But, um, you know, Jesus didn't go up on that mountain all night long and talk to God for hours at a time. No, Jesus was connected to and formed in the spirit of God that night. In the flow of, allowing that love to express itself through him. That's what he was about that night. And following that night on the mountain, is this wonderful little story, and I don't take it literally, I don't think you should either, but you can if you want. It's a wonderful story of Jesus walking on the water understand in the Jewish tradition, the water is the chaos that can swallow us up. And Jesus is just walking on the surface of the water as though he can take that chaos and make something controlled out of it, even invites Peter out onto the water to walk with him. He failed, but that's a, another story. The third time Jesus went up to the mountain, he went up to heal. So with a formed character, having connected to the presence of God so that the power of God's love can work through us, Jesus then did the work of healing the community. What would it look like if we did that? If we found ourselves formed in the love and the character of God, that's why we do this exercise at the beginning of each of these gatherings. Seek that way to express the love of God more clearly. We'll talk in the future about what it might mean to pray and to draw on the strength and power of the creative force of God. What would it be if we did those things and then began to heal? Then began to, you know, express love even in the midst of conflict. To find the good in everyone, even Donald Trump and fan that flame, let it live and let it glow. What would that be like? Well, he went up on the mountain one more time and he had only one thing to say, go out and gather a community, start a movement, make something happen. That's what's going to build the spiritual infrastructure of our large community. Is if we go out and we make something happen if we share these words of wisdom that have been pointing this direction for thousands of years. My tradition, sure, in the Jewish tradition, yes, in many other traditions. You dig down deep and you find it's about expressing the creative dynamic of God into the world. Four things, an ethical formation reaching out so that we can express the love of God, connecting to, drawing from the power of God because we can't get it done alone, doing the work that we need to do in the healing and an effort to reshape our culture and then gather the community around, start a movement, make it happen so that more and more and more people are doing exactly what we're trying to do. Can you see it? Can you picture it? Maybe, maybe it's just in a small way. Maybe you just see a group in your living room that's working towards these ends. Friends that can share with you the desire to build a new world. Maybe it'll be people going into the current religious institutions. They're impoverished and they're embattled. They need new life from people. Can you picture it? Those communities being transformed so that there's greater connection to God, greater life, greater commitment. You know, most of them are moving in the right direction. Can you see, I don't know, the media starting to offer images of people with spiritual infrastructure instead of caricatures of the nonsense what preachers look like on TV, cringe every time they show a preacher on TV. Can you picture it? A movement growing? It requires you. 
for the world to become complete, to be at peace, but not just kind of that absence of conflict peace, but the, the Hebrew kind of peace, the, the wholeness. For a world to move there, you and I need to do the work. We need to write the blog post that says, no, we can't hate like that. We need to encourage, we need to invite. We need to spread the word. God's counting on it. The time is now. No time for delay. It's time to brace our feet on the rock of ages and swing this unwilling world around. Because a new world will emerge. What it looks like depends at least in part on people like you. <laughs>